Welcome back for part two of the simulated universe lore. Last time, we left off with the creation of the swarm and in this video I'll be covering the events during their rampage, leading up to where Taze Ronth meets their end. I want to once again add a disclaimer that I work on this content almost entirely by myself with some small peer review from my friends, so I make no guarantees that the timeline is completely flawless, but I have tried to make it as accurate and coherent as possible with the information available to us now. I'd also like to add a spoiler warning for patch 2.1. While this script was written mostly in 2.0, I did make some small additions and I'll be showing some relevant clips on screen. Without further ado, let's get right back into it. The swarm disaster is thoroughly underway and the desolation has begun. During the second plane, aka swarm disaster, encounter, we were on a planet with the swarm. They devoured all of the crops and animals. From within a huge device we watch on screen as the swarm evolves into large weapons of war. We wondered at the source of the technological modification. We know from the origin universe story that it is very likely connected to something that Crown Guy was up to. Destruction 2 as a first plane completion encounter should come first. Herta was confused that we were taking the path of destruction despite Nanook not existing in the time period. Ran May hushed her and we were graced with the chilling and authoritative presence of Anna. We were suspended by invisible strings, as though someone was manipulating us like a puppet. The gentle movements of their fingertips rattled the intricate order of the universe, which caused our strong urge to destroy to come to a sudden halt. We were unsure if Enna placated us out of love or out of an intense and unstoppable desire for order. This part suggests that the path of destruction is not able to exist in worlds controlled by Enna. We learned from Herta that Enna is one of the most ancient eons and that their path suppressed numerous calamities. Empires thundered beneath the eon as the believers roared in harmony. I believe this to be a description of the Beyond the Sky Choir. Enna appeared to float despite their massive and heavy body, and their countenance glowed like a sacred hymn. Every word they uttered sounded like vertically aligned syllables with either a somber or posh tone. Enna asked a very important question. Who is the dream maker that pulls and influences the will of transmutation? I shall keep the order under complete control and eliminate the troublemakers. The troublemakers shall not remain, and the greedy shall not be spared. The treacherous and fickle chaos is what contaminates the universe. Enna is absolute, just, and magnificent. Their multiple syllables carried the solemnity of an army, concealing with them a rule that must not be overlooked. Note the unusual text surrounded Enna's speech. This is because their speech is made up of empires, states, and civilizations that have risen and fallen in predestined times and sequence in accordance with the Aeon's control. Destruction 1 is next, at an unknown time during Swarm Universe. This one is similar to the previous one in that someone who is feeling the rage of destruction is quelled by the Aeon with threats, Enna. The trailblazer broke out, which caused Ron May to protest that destruction will never appear here. Herta reiterates that, because Nanook is the youngest Aeon, they should not have anything to do with the swarm. Elation 1 happened at an unknown time during the swarm universe, but I'll discuss it now also. We encounter a ha, they call a ball, they give us a die, and claim they want to use it to knock out Taseronth. They do a little bit of a ha typical fourth wall breaking, then claim that everything they do is to help Enna, and that their pleasure is to help other gods. This is likely what Gondola Helping Gods is named after. They then ask us if we're going to join in the fun and if we want to know their thoughts on the Astral Express and Tazeronth. Screwlum claims that the path of propagation has threatened the Trailblaze for some reason and concludes that the Trailblaze might be involved. Next are the secrets which cover all the non-Eon encounters. First is Bounty Hunter 2. We find out here that Tazeronth is breeding at an alarming rate and hollowing out planets on their path. Two thirds of known existence falls victim to the swarm. This pushes the title of Bounty Hunter to the brink of extinction. The Hunters had been using their licenses to coordinate movements during the disaster. They had suspected that Tazeronth was seeking revenge, presumably for the war against the Elidicnid soldiers at the Lepismat system, but they had come to realise Tazeronth had no intention of seeking retribution and is purely on a path of propagation. Calling the contact number reveals the Bounty Hunters had decided to set up an intergalactic bar where they were selling juices made with their single clawed hand. Then we have Gondola Part 2, which has a crazy amount of info in it for how short it is. Firstly, it tells us the masked fools at their tavern at the world's end were trying to make drinks out of the insects as the swarm passed by. The most fascinating part is how they tried to make wine out of chitin and cumin. 
Do you remember how previously Aha had been singing about the universe burning and tossing cumin on it? I think this implies that Aha had known that the swarm was going to be created before it was. And that fact, combined with their manipulation in the Origin universe, suggests they are the culprit. This encounter also reveals that Aha uses water ripples in goblets to communicate with the Masked Fools, explaining the cup in the Path of Elation icon. The Masked Fools, at Aha's command to assist the Eons, stole the Morning Actor's gondola and accidentally took a group of Nameless along with them. The journey was full of twists and turns, and you check every possible path to protect yourself from Aha's lies. The gondola became packed with a motley group of passengers, but the Masked Fools were nowhere to be found. At that moment, you suspected that you were enjoying the thrill of being deceived by Aha. Honestly, I'm not sure if this deception implies that all of the Masked Fools left or if they turned into other passengers and blended in, but I think it's more likely the latter. Next, I want to bring up a few regular occurrences. There is one that describes Tazeronth as the Lord of Eternal Slumber, one where an explorer encounters high-tech traps left by hunters outside of swarm nests, and one where you step into an old-fashioned trap made of branches and leaves on a planet called Bled. Bled appears to be a planet where Tazeronth stops to sleep for a while. Bounty Hunter Part 5 describes a first encounter between Intelligrons and an organic life. The organic person was a hooded traveller who accidentally landed on their planet. He stayed there for a while to lecture them while weeping, an emotion that was new to the Intelligence. He imparted the lesson that research has shown that the blood of different species of insects is not of the same colour. This line is interesting because it identifies this guy as very likely being the bounty hunter who killed his lover, the bounty hunter leader, before running away. His previous line was that the blood of hunters with different paths was not of the same colour, and the variation here suggests that the hunters either were or became insects in the end. This premise is much less far-fetched than it sounds because the phase flame, the object that Ifrit the Duke Inferno was born from, was first invented by a genius society member named Circle, who was literally a spider. So do with that information what you will. Sand King Part 8 describes someone hiding from the swarm. They aspire to be like Louis Fleming, one of the two men who founded the IPC. He has a pocket watch that can interpret Morse code distress signal frequencies. There are three signals. First is from an Alothian guard. This city appears to be associated with Enna because El refers to God and Thea means goddess. My friend Stella discovered that this might also be a reference to the Phoenician Empire and the first Queen Dido, who is in a roundabout way associated with both Frebus and the Duke Inferno. I'm not going to explain that much because it's not super important at the moment, but I might explain in future if there's interest or relevance. The second signal comes from a synesthesia centre on Trash Hill, where the residents were hoping to be rescued within two hours. Anna sent an escort, but they were unfortunately too late. The third is from microbes living on the podded planet called Green Hill. It was an experiment by a genius who loved tiny intelligent beings, somewhat reminiscent of Doctor Who's Whoville, honestly. A single true sting took them out, but logs from the Xianzhou suggest that Yaosha restored life there much later, and Green Hill eventually became an ally of the Alliance. There's also this weird speed universe thing mentioned, but I'm not quite sure what it means right now. Look out for a comment or something later if I figure it out. Sand King 2 was mentioned briefly in the Origin Universe video, but there's more to discuss here. I'm not sure when this scene took place, but it mostly consists of flashbacks anyway. It's about the isolated Mandela Island and how the inhabitants handled the swarm. We encounter an odd-looking multicoloured flame that we extinguish with seawater to reveal a charred photo frame and a drowned knife. Speaking with the photo frame chimes an irresistible fear within you. As you gaze upon it, you detect how fate expresses itself. The Mandolin Islanders draw on photos, creating colourful wings upon the image of their family members' shoulders. This could be either feathered or insect wings, but I'm inclined to think it is insect wings, because it was their fate to turn into insects. It also suggests that the flames represent their life, and that the flames are extinguished when the island turns into a breeding ground for the swarm. There's also a chance that this flame is a reference to the story of the cremator who used a colourful flame to affect your memories in another occurrence. The second option is to make a small cut with the drowned knife. The ravenous desire for destruction smoulders in your heart, born from fear, and as you touch the knife, you see the story of a one-armed father who used the knife to defend his daughter, but 
Amidst the devastation of the swarm, the daughter took her own life. You realize that there is nothing else on this island except love and loneliness. Next, we resume the story of Crown Guy in Lepismart System Part 5. There is nothing left of the kingdom he created. An old man, Crown Guy, sits with grizzled hair and twisted ankles amidst dunes and sand warriors, keeping the swarm at bay with his sand walls. He appears to have overcome aging and is tormented. He doesn't understand why he won't die. He scratches at his ankles and shows you the sand towers he has crafted. Regardless of whether you compliment or destroy them, he smiles and thanks you before letting out a torrent of furious curses. He explains how he created more or less a whole city out of sand, including a metropolis for slaves. He witnessed his mini-empire rise and fall. He says he's so skilled in this craft that he once restored civilization in a land possessed of naught but corpses. However, he is exhausted and ready to depart to the next world. There are also sand mechs mentioned, which I find interesting because of the lore from the Firmament Frontline Glamoth Relic set that is inspired by fairies and suggests that mechas were used primarily to combat the swarm. This may all be related to the lore of Stellar on Hunter Sam, especially since we see scorched planets in combat with them. We encounter Crown Guy again shortly after in Lepismart Part 2. This time he is more or less a corpse on the ground that we kick. He lifts his head and meets your gaze. Again, if we speak to him, he thanks us, smiles, and then furiously curses. His curses are in a hoarse and anguished voice, lamenting that even after defeating the bounty hunters, he failed in his mission to find the self that he had been seeking before arriving at Lepismart. And he started to believe that the person who had recorded the whispers of finality he was following was nothing more than a liar. Despite this, he persisted in his conquests. He curses and reattached the half of his head that we kicked away before. The story of the Beyond the Sky Choir is continued in part two. This time it talks about how the singing of the choir was being muffled by the high walls created by the architects of Klopoth. A young singer, the younger brother of the twins, tragically falls into the sea after climbing over the wall with the older brother using the inseparable deception. Part 1 suggests that the older brother killed the younger brother here. The sacrifice of the younger brother marked the end of the farcical dispute between the choir and the architects. A crowd kneeled by the shore and expressed their thanks for the drowned, even if they didn't know which twin it was. The path of nihility here is to kneel at a straight angle next to the shore, the posture to greet a god. I would like to note that this feels a bit like a ritualistic sacrifice. The waters of the sea are akin to a silken sheet of glass blades unendingly rising and falling. It is a swarmless, serene sight beneath the waters. Your hand is caught by a strange force, but you have already established resonance with Enna using the right angle. Keep in mind here that this sea is very likely not a literal ocean and is probably the quantum sea associated with the nihility that Penacone is falling into. There will be a little bit more about this later. If you devote yourself to saving the younger brother, you jump into the sea with a splash and your vision underwater is muddled. You can see kaleidoscopic rays of light enshrouding the drowned. This is most likely Enna. After his death, the drowned younger brother would be known for having the most moving and holier voices that ever harmonized four gods in the ancient era. At some point during the Swarm universe, the architect's story continues in part two with the same lazy Bigfoot's walls being smashed through by the Swarm, ending the clash between the two parties. The architect's wife decides to leave the group and join the gondola, which happens to be passing through this area at the time, to the dismay of the architect. You wait with the architect until there is nothing left to do but leave also. Now we turn to Eon Encounters to describe most of what comes next. Remembrance 1 describes a surge of odd sounds. Animals, plants, crying babies. The crying fails to get any attention because nobody cares about them even though they are dying. Multiple invisible shadow arms are collecting and capturing them in the void. The sounds are drowned out by the waves as you find yourself in the middle of an ocean turned red beneath a scarlet sun. From the waves comes an alluring singing voice, a trap set by Ouroboros. You know the purple flickering flames are not an antidote, but you can't help but be drawn in. At this point, Herda stops the simulation. We observe as the Ouroboros opens their mouth at the point where the spreading of the swarm reaches its peak, and they swallow planets and swarm alike. Herder comments that Ouroboros and Tazerant seem like enemies. The remembrance splits into numerous fragments that flood your brain. 
It is described as a grand birth accompanied by the wailing and roaring of all beings. These are the voices you heard earlier. As supported by her statement that some believe Fuli came about during this catastrophe, I believe this describes the birth of Fuli, and that the invisible arms collecting voices are their first efforts at preserving the memories of dying worlds falling into the sea. Dwindling of Stars Part 2 described how the path of propagation was revealed in a low wine and Tazeroth led the swarm into the universe to consume everything, up until they encountered the Eon Ouroboros. In this encounter, we met a depth crawler, presumably a creature on the path of veracity, who had raised several planets to the ground, but was overwhelmed by its loneliness. We had the choice to cuddle up with the non-hostile creature or to shoot it through the heart. This passage emphasizes the soul and emotions experienced by that creature. Next is Remembrance 2. This one is long and consists largely of flashbacks as per Fooley's memories. Interestingly, it provides a timeline for the swarm disaster as being hundreds of ember eras ago, which is anywhere between 15,000 to 216,000 years ago. Because we do know that the IPC was established before the swarm disaster and that they were established nearly 800 ember eras ago, this does narrow it down to a maximum of about 700 ember eras, which is up to 168,000 years ago. This is unfortunately still not useful information, but it might come in handy later. Continuingly, Fully shows us that the fight between Tazeroth and Ouroboros lasted 5 amb eras, so between 350 to 1,200 years. We see Ouroboros' face rise from the waves. By the way, this sea can be interpreted as the body of Ix, where they function as both a whirlpool in the sea and a black hole in space. This is why you have Penagoni seeking into a sea, which is also actually a black hole of nihility. It's the same sea that Fooly plucks the memories of worlds from to preserve them before they become nothing. I think of it like a galaxy where Ix is a black hole in the middle, and all of the stars are slowly drawn towards the center, except Hoyo describes it as an ocean. Anyway, the Leviathan, Ouroboros, lives inside of this sea and emerges, and memories from their followers inundate our mind. The beasts fall sick due to their belief in the Aeon. Along with the lively drumbeats and song, the beast passes by a harbour beneath the glow of holy radiance, once again emerging upon the land. Its fallen scale is consecrated in a temple of the primeval Imperium. Note here that the primeval Imperium is the civilization that the Shenzhou ships came from, and that this would have happened many thousands of years before the fleet was created. Amid the resounding drumbeats, the lanterns fall, a force overflows from the bones, and the murmurs of the deceased scatter like dust. Two beggars knock their ancient bowls on the street while a relentless swarm engulfs and bites them. During the grapple, three agonized whales explode like thunder. This story tells us that the primeval Imperium was caught up in the war between the propagation and the veracity. The next paragraph mentions a beastmaster who dances and controls his movements with his ankles and toes, following the streak of light. I interpret a streak of light as Akavili because the trailblaze is usually described as a shooting star. Beasts in the context of these memories describe followers of Ouroboros, and I'm reminded of the dancing woman on top of Ouroboros in their portrait. The choir members fall silent after being drowned by the tide, and the brothers cast aside their crowns and embrace each other in tears. This is referring to the twin brothers in the Beyond the Sky Choir story. More deaths have taken place in the world, and most of them happen in silence. Silence implies that Enna's choir was unable to reach them in time. The ferocious beast takes in the swarm next, finally put an end to the Fuhrer. It exhales the smoke of fury and is clad in colourful armour. With its head held high, it leaps into the sky and disappears. Only the sound of it plunging into the waves can be heard. Unbeknownst to Ouroboros, Enna the Order is observing the devastating and escalating chaos in the universe. To summarize, I think Ouroboros emerging from the sea caused a tidal wave, similar to the one that drowned us in Remembrance 1. This tide drowned the choir that was detained by the IPC at the edge of the sea, which we know because the younger brother fell into the sea from the top of the wall. The surge would have drowned everybody, uniting the brothers in death, or perhaps a dream. We do know that Ix makes you sleepy after all. We nearly get devoured by the Ouroboros, but Fooly stops it with new memories that they appear to want us to preserve before we fall into the Nihility, aka the ocean. Curiously enough, these memories contain the crackling howls of the Annihilation Gang. Songs, battles, ravenous hunger, elimination, interaction, wailing, genuineness, capturing the Sand King, memories, back of the ocean, as devouring, fighting, actors, the emptiness, reverse, 
Old Shadow's writing. The voices were all split into different personalities telling different stories. What these memories imply is unknown to me at the moment, but Herta kind of implies that the memories are supposed to be the entire history of the universe. I'm sure this will make more sense later, so look out for a comment amending this part. Genius Society Regular Experiments Part 2 and 3 both discuss the life of Nombardi II. Part 2 begins with Skrulem stating that the original intent of the universe's creator was to instill patience and love into every ordinary being. He then asks Herda about the status of Nobadi II. Turns out he had been a baker with a passion for food, particularly steam buns. When the war broke out between the Swarm and Ouroboros, the bakery collapsed from the earthquakes and he refused to leave. No superheroes had come to save him, but it does seem like they ran this simulation twice, and the next time they sent superheroes, but he declined them. Nobadi II was just one of many lives that were ruined in the battle. Herda says that Nobadi III will carry on the will of his predecessors, but Ron May declares it will not be necessary and shuts down the experiment. Keep in mind that Ron May is most interested in researching eons and was actively trying to reproduce an emanator of propagation, so she probably obtained all of the data required here. Gondola Helping Gods Part 5 tells us about how all the different factions on the gondola are divided in their support of the gods. One night, you barge into the hallway of the memory zone and the previously drowsy morning actor wishes to gift to you the memory bubble that contained the Shade of Nihility, though we're not supposed to know that yet. She says it has a shadow within it, but doesn't elaborate further. Whether or not you accept or decline is irrelevant, and at the end of the intermission, you resume your daily antics. Until everyone gets caught up in a miasma of insect wing powder and plunges into a state of delirium. In the chaos, a nameless accidentally hits the button that sends everyone to the Elidicna star zone, the location where the swarm was first created and where the ruined crown guy now sits alone, undead in the sand. Previously, Anna had been looking for the dream maker who controls the will of transmutation. In Preservation 1, this person is confirmed to be Klopoth. This encounter describes how Klopoth's walls had kept the disasters in the universe at bay with heaps of insect carcasses and butterfly wings at the bottom of the fortress. Many creatures are toiling away to build the fortress higher and higher. Kapoth approaches, apparently communicating via an unusual scent. Enna is in the sky, and 100 million members of their choir appear to have turned into weapons, and are spread out beneath them like a beam, ready for war. These are the dull aluminum flakes surrounding the flickering eye. They embrace the scattered head of Kapoth. Enna says, You have finally accepted my invitation, Kapoth. The troublemakers go against the rules. Their actions are unpardonable. Amber Lord, as one that controls the will of transmutation, you bear great responsibility. Hoda tells us that this is Enna extending an invitation towards Klopoth, and that ending Tazeroth was a joint effort of all the eons. Herta believes their deal was probably related to the Ouroboros. Dwindling 5 is our final entry. It tells us that eons after the war, history fictionologists sat in their vaulted libraries, writing down these histories unknown to the majority. Note that the history fictionologists are, of course, followers of the Enigmata mythos that specialize in creating fake history to destroy the true history, as history has the power to determine the future. The true agenda of mythos is hard to pin down now, but know that it is almost certain every story listed here is false. This is why we don't trust characters like the Xiaojo storyteller Mr. Xian and his bird, who I believe are supposed to be our first introduction to history fictionologists as well as the Penacony backstory provided by Gallagher, who was identified as a follower of Mythos by Sunday. And that concludes the events of the Swarm universe. All this talk about transmutation is going to be pretty important in part 3, where we'll be covering the conclusion of the Swarm, the creation of Shipei, and the aftermath of the Amber Era. Part 3 is going to be pretty mind-blowing, so make sure you're there for it by subscribing or writing down a note to check back in a few weeks. Up to you, really, but trust me when I say that the Ember universe is the most important part, and if you've come this far, then you definitely don't want to miss it. As always, I can't wait to chat in the comments, and I'll be adding some extra readable content to the description. See you guys next time.